anyway, and real quick, I don't want to spend too much time, but I will tell you this. The Lord knows how to remind it. And, and I'm not ashamed one bit. I used to apologize. I've been working I've been working with Peak Roofing for the last couple of years, and that's been a great blessing in my life and the opportunity to even minister to people through that. And obviously, it's been pretty crazy the last few days. But let me just show you how the Lord is. See, in the midst of all of that, you can be so focused on everything else that you're doing, right? And this is just an example. So I needed Rob and them to help me tarp this homeowner's roof or felt it in. And we had our roofers over there. And it was a roof that was so bad that the roofers at some point in time wanted to tie a rope to hold on because the shingle was old and the pitch was very steep. Well, they had some various things that they needed some help with. And so I got my little roof climbing boots on and Robert laughs at me. I'm not going to get into details why, but whenever I'm climbing these tall roofs and I carried the felt up there and I carried the drill up there, whatever. And while I was on in that valley and the granules were coming down, okay, and, and, the, and it was bad enough to where the roofer wanted a rope, that's not even when all of a sudden in my heart, the Lord reminded me of shame. Now, you know that that's got to be God, right? <laughs> because I'm on a, like a 10 or more pitch roof. The shingles are bad. And like all of a sudden, this over, and we're about to get rained on. And Robert's like, man, dude, we need to pray that the Lord will part the sky. And I'm like, yes, we do, sir, because we got stuff we got to do. But guess what? In this prayer, we also need to pray for shame. Because the Lord just put him on my heart out of nowhere. So why am I going on and on about it? Because I was an, I, I'm an, I was an ICU nurse. Too. And you see, you, I understand something about where Shane is that you don't understand. And that's probably why it keeps on coming to my mind. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I used to take care of patients that were on mental illness, that were sick. Like that. And all I'm trying to say is, I'm just encouraging you, please don't forget about us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> please don't forget about our brother. Amen. And when, if, the, if his name crosses your mind, yeah. wherever you are, just stop for a second. It don't have, it, and, just, and just put a prayer up to the Lord. Amen. Let's trust God. Lord, touch it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, listen, I am so glad to be able to be back in the house of the Lord. And I mean that with all of my heart. You know, you don't even, and I know I've said that before, but you know, we're going to be in Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 12 through 14 this morning. You, know, you don't even, you really, you know, we don't understand what we don't have till we don't have. And I don't know if you feel the same way or not. But when I've been out of the house of the Lord for a period of time, I want to be in the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and even though I don't necessarily hang out with you guys during the week, when I see your faces here at the, at, at the church, when I see you, you know, I can't even tell you that I, how happy I am to see you. I mean, you may not believe that, but that, that's just reality. You know, even simple little things. I, you know, I don't know if it's, a, if it's a bad thing or a good thing that as a pastor, and I don't even know if it's because I'm a pastor or some, the way my brain's wired, I notice everything. And what I guess I'm just saying is, is that there's such little things that I start to appreciate about, appreciate about each and every one of us. Caitlin walks up this morning and I noticed that her, I hope she didn't mind me saying her belly looked different. And then I look down and yeah, she's carrying a baby. <laughs> In the midst of one of these songs, I'm just worshiping the Lord. And then all of a sudden, Shelby sings a little piece of harmony and all I heard for a second was his voice. Yeah. And then I was like, I'm just being real. I ain't trying to point you out, but I was like, man, look, I appreciate Shelby. And then I looked over there and I saw Rich move up to the mic and the and I was like you and so it's just these little bitty things that that help me to understand the importance of the body and how important y'all are in my life. And I hope that the Lord uses me in your life. Amen. But we are a family, amen. We're supposed to be a family. Amen. And uh so praise the Lord. It's good to be with you this morning. Amen. Let's get into the word of God. We're in Romans chapter six. We, and, and this is the first time I've done a series on Romans six in on a Sunday morning, but I felt like it was important. I wish we had more of our regulars here, but listen, times are crazy. And I hope that you joining in on video or you will watch it at some point in time can get something out of this season. We, we believe in Rome and the importance of Romans six. I will tell you this. This and I understand that this is a man's opinion, but to me, this one chapter right here has been the most important chapter of my life in the effect of changing me, in the effect of changing my understanding of the overall word of God, 
in the effect of teaching me what sanctification means. Now, what does sanctification mean? It means simply to be separated, to be made whole. Now, i got to be careful with time. But what do you mean to be made holy and to be separated? Not you acting holy or trying to make yourself holy. No. Jesus, when you got born again and you started to surrender. See, the day you got born again, you were already made whole. Why? Because you changed positions. You were born of Adam into sin. Then you got born again, if you're born again. If you're not born again, if you're watching on video, if you're in this place and you're not born again, basically a lot of what I'm going to say may not make sense, but Holy Spirit, I depend on you to stimulate the heart and the mind to make people have a desire to understand better. Amen? Because I can't do it. I realize that. Whenever you were first born of Adam, you were born into sin. But when you got born again, there was a spiritual position change. Meaning the Lord took you out of this darkened, sin-riddled world and he put you in Christ. And in God's mind, you died with him. You were buried with him. And in God's mind, you were resurrected with Jesus and you became a new man in Christ. And that was a, that was a complete game changer, for lack of better words. And that's... The original point of what sanctification means. It means you were separated from the world into Christ. That's the, that's the root cause of what that means. Uh, you know, I've been over here, and Lord, forgive me because I've used so many words and I got over it. I've been over here for the last four days trying to think, why is my brain the way that it is? And I'm not going to go through all the. I have psychoanalyzed myself for the last four days because of the. <laughs> The way that everything comes out of me. And one of the things that I realized is, is that I have to understand why. You may not feel that way. And it's okay. Sometimes I wonder if it's not a curse. <laughs> I have to understand why. I have to get to the root cause of why before I can just give myself over to it. And one of the things that I'm trying to tell you is, is you're just going to, because I'm not even going to dissect it and break it down. I could spend three hours easily breaking it down and proving it to you at the very level of the Greek word. But we're not going to do that. You just got to trust me and believe me that on the day that you got saved, if you got saved, something supernatural and spiritual happened to you in the mind of God, happened to you in the spiritual realm that you cannot see yet you live in each and every minute of each and every day. And on that day that you got saved, you were separated. You were sanctified. Hallelujah. You were changed from this place and you were put in this place and you're no longer a worldling. You're now a God, a God serving person. Okay. Now that was the first part, but now you got to get to the place where you understand some of that. And if you don't understand it, you're not going to grow in your sanctification. Right. You're not going to grow in your separation. Oh, what you're talking about, preacher? Because you're going to still drive down the road and your mouth is going to still sound like the that, like your neighbor that's still in the world on the side. Yeah. Right. What are you talking about, preacher? Christians don't talk the way the world talks, my friend. Yeah, that's right. I'm over there. That's another job. Last night, probably about 11 o'clock, and the doctor comes in and he says something in front of a female nurse. And I was like, oh, my God. He didn't say it to her, but I'm thinking to myself, most people would have just sat there and laughed. And I'm thinking, dude, how insensitive towards the female gender. And he was just saying a joke to me. I, you know, Christians that are separated, that are saved, don't talk like that anymore. Christians that, they, that you know, are changed. Their life at some point in time changed. And I'm not saying this to beat you down and to weigh you down. We all got work that the Lord used to do in us. Does that make sense? It's not my point here. My point here is, is that the gospel is real. Jesus is real. The moving and operation of the Holy Spirit is real. On the day that you got saved, you were changed and separated and sanctified and made holy. You just didn't know it yet. But in order for your life to actually start looking like that, you're going to need to know some things, my friend. You're going to need to care enough to look into it. You may not have to look into it at the level that I do, 
But you're going to need to have a desire to understand what Jesus did for you on the cross. That's what Romans 6 does. One Greek scholar called it the mechanics of our sanctification. It means how the one little bolt down there tightened up enough causes all the cogs in the machinery to work on. And, and there's a lot of depth to it. But one of the main things as we're going to about to get into this is this, is that I want, I want you to know because we need to, we need to be able to move through <clears throat> is that whenever this word sin is used in the context of Romans six, it's not talking about your behavior. It's talking about the root cause of sin. It's talking about the factory that produces sin. It's talking about the fact that you were born of Adam as a sinner and you have a sinful nature in you. Part of your machinery in your first birth is compelled to go towards sin. So it's not talking about the symptoms of sin, if I could speak that way. The lust, the adultery, the addiction, the cussing, the driving down the road, the selfishness, the yelling because Burger King lady forgot your pickles or whatever it is. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is not telling you the truth. How many times do people go off? I know they turn, they tune me out when I start talking about it because they know. But that's all a reflection on your Lord. Jesus never fussed and yelled at somebody because they forgot his pickle on his cheeseburger. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Je no, no, no. I don't think we get it. Jesus willingly came to earth and clothed himself in the tent of human flesh so that for one reason, not to be a cute little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, 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 no. To die on a Roman cross, naked, brutalized, spit upon, all for the purpose of you and the human race so that they could be changed from their first birth in Adam to a new birth in him. Hallelujah. And so that they could be changed each and every day so that they would start looking less like a worldly and more yeah. like him. The scripture for that is, is that I am conformed into the image of Christ. A molding is taking place in the life of the believer. And in order to understand some of that, we have to understand Romans 6. And a big part of Romans 6 is what I just told you. That that old man born of Adam that was born with this sinful nature, when he got saved, he was born again. And there was a change that took place to the relationship between the believer and the sinful nature. It's very important that we understand that. Your sinful nature is not eradicated when you get saved. That won't happen until we get to glory. The word of God teaches us that when we see him, we will be as he is. We're not going to be a little guy like the Mormons teach. Oh, why are you beating up all the... Because it's not true. It's not the same as Jesus. And I'm not going to apologize for it anymore. The, the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses is not the same Jesus. The Jesus of the Mormons is not the same Jesus. Je I'm sorry, the Jesus of the Catholics is not the same. Now, many Catholics want to believe in the real Jesus, but at the foundational doctrinal level of the Catholic Church, it ain't the same Jesus, my friend. Because, see, they're re-crucifying him every Sunday when they have the Mass, when they transubstantiate, literally turn the bread into the hocus pocus. That's where, did you know that that's where the word hocus pocus comes from? That's exactly right. It's like a Latin word for hoculum, whatever. And it, corpus is having to do with the body. Cor the word corpus is connected to the word body in Latin. That's where the word hocus pocus for magic came from. From the supposed transubstantiation of a piece of bread into the literal flesh of Christ. And every time that they do that, they re-crucify him. That is not the same Jesus. And I'm not going to apologize anymore for saying it. And so I want you to understand that. There's a real Jesus. And he's the one that we want to grab a hold of. He's the one that we want to submit our lives to. Because if we will do that, it will change us. And it will cause us to look more like him. Amen. And that's one of the reasons that you don't have as many people in this church. That's what you're going to have to down the road. 
Am I supposed to be sorry for that? No. Preacher. I mean, I don't, and you know, when I say all that, it's not like I'm asking you to be okay with me and to pat me on the back. I had, I've been mandated by God. I was in a barroom bathroom when the Lord spoke to me. He said, you will present my word for the way that it is written and then I will use you. I didn't even know what that meant. What I realized is this. There was a whole lot of people that were presenting his word in a way that it was not written. It's God's word. He's told me before, get your grubby little fingers out of my word and present it for the way that I wrote it. And I was sitting over there thinking about Brother Larson. No, my, my mind's everywhere. And I was thinking about the time that Robert and I and a couple other people went over there and I preached for a chapel service for their Bible college. And I was thinking when I was done, man, that is the most powerful that I have ever felt the Holy Spirit move through me. I'm not saying that the students felt that. But when I, what I felt on that day was like I was being used as a conduit. I felt the power of God. It was the most amazing thing. And you know what? I sit down at lunch with Brother Larson. You know what he says? One other thing is, try not to be so militaristic. <laughs> I don't take that bad. But do you understand, Brother Larson, if you, I know you're not watching my little video today. I've tried not to be so militaristic. What does it mean? I think it means like you're acting like you're a Marine. You're preaching like you're a Marine. You're, you know. And you're in the Army. It, that, well, that has something to do with my message this morning. Maybe that's why the Lord put that on my mind. I've tried not to seem so correct. I've tried. And it's not. He, this is what he called me to do. He didn't call me to please everybody. He called me to tell the truth. Amen? Amen. How many people in the Bible can we say told the truth? I'm not trying to put myself in their league. Come on. I'm just saying. How many people in the Bible can we think of that told the truth? And they weren't rewarded on earth for it by any stretch of the matter of fact, their heads were cut off. They were sawn asunder. Their families were killed. They were thrown into prison. They were thrown into chains. And there's coming a day, and I've told you before, even in this country right here, where there will be a day when it ain't going to be real cool to be a preacher of the gospel. Not when you tell them. All right. So let's get into Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. I didn't really title my message. I meant to put it in there, and I was going to title it, You're in the Army Now. <laughs> so here's Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. It says, Let not sin, again, that sinful nature that we were talking about, that part that's in your spiritual DNA. I'm just using that as a, as a way to illustrate it. Uh, so it's talking about the factory that produces sin, not so much your individual sin that you deal with on a daily basis. Because you see, if we can let Jesus deal with the root of the sin, then we're going to see the symptoms of sin start to go away. Not, not, we're not going to walk in perfection, but we're going to start to see that less of those words slip out of our mouth. We're going to start to see that, oh, she forgot my pickles, but that poor girl right there is going through something right now. You see what I'm saying? You know, I was thinking even in the song, you're all I need. I don't need a new house today, Lord. I don't need a new car. But then the Lord corrected me. He said, yeah, but there might be somebody in this place or watching on video that needs a new house right now. Amen. But then the Lord reminded, but you're right, because I am all. Amen. And if they will burn them, I can get them a new house. Yeah. Or I can definitely take care of their dwelling. Come on, somebody. The Lord is going to take care of our needs, not our wants. Come on. Yeah. And sometimes they'll give you a superfluous, a big, abundant blessing. Is what Amen. I'm going to break it down. Okay. <laughs> he'll, he'll give you a blessing that's bigger than you can handle. I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll pour you out a blessing that you're not even able to contain if you will trust me. If you will give in to me, I will give it back unto you. But listen, this ain't no spiritual lottery like the word of faith preacher. Oh, you give me a thousand dollar heart seed and I'm going to give you, a th the Lord's going to give you a ten thousand dollar harvest. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to tell you that it ain't never happened, but that ain't the way God works. Amen. You were supposed to want to give unto the Lord because, of, because he's worthy. Amen? Amen? All right, here we go. Let not sin therefore reign like a king in your mortal body that you should obey it. That word is connected back to what? Sin. You're not, sin is not supposed to be the king of your life, and you're not supposed to be obeying sin's commands. Does that make sense? You should obey it in the lust thereof. Because you see, and listen, that word lust, I'm going to break it down for you a little bit this morning as we move forward. That word lust means a desire. And sometimes it means a good desire in the Greek, or sometimes it means a bad desire. You might not have understood that. When we translate it into English, it automatically sounds bad because we connect it to sexual 
desires. But the word lust literally means a desire, period. And depending on the context, it could be a good desire. You could have the Holy Spirit lust for us. Meaning the Holy Spirit desires that we would serve God. Amen? Just like, and, 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 but the flesh lusts for what it wants. Right, right. God desires that we would desire him, but our flesh, that fallen nature that we've already talked about this morning, <laughs> desires that it would get what it wants. Whatever it is. Not necessarily some sexual appetite with something that we're not supposed to have. More money, bigger things, pickles on my cheeseburger, whatever it is. My flesh has a desire that it would get what it wants. And the Holy Spirit's saying, but, but I want you to desire me. And if you'll desire me, you're going to start looking more. Like Amen? So that's what the, but in this context, it's talking about sinful lust. Sinful desires. Because sin in this context is reigning as a king. But it shouldn't be reigning as a king in the life of the believer. You shouldn't be obeying it. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. What do you think members means right there? I mean, let's just stop for a second and think about that. I mean, you know, have, yeah. Bridget waving her hand. She's talking about it. She's doing this number here because it's talking about your body parts. Right? <laughs> it's talking about your body parts. Your hands, your fingers, your feet. The physical attributes of the human body that club that in that tabernacle, that the Holy Spirit tabernacle. So my feet bring me to places. My hands pick up certain things. My mouth speaks certain words. My ears, I allow my ears to hear certain things. Now, I didn't ask that doctor to make that little comment that he made in front of that nurse, but my ears heard it. But sometimes I turn a knob and I allow my ears to hear it. That's something different. And, you know, it's a little bit different whenever, and maybe some of you say, yeah, but my problem's not music, preacher. And that's fine. But listen, when I walk into Walmart now, I ain't got to stick my fingers in my ears because, <clears throat> and I always use the same example, Vince Neal singing about climbing into the saddle with somebody and drinking whiskey. I don't have to walk through Walmart like wah 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 wah. No, I mean, I might it might bring back some memories, but it's like, dude, I know I don't want to climb up in the saddle and drink whiskey. Okay, the Lord has done enough in my life to make me know that. But at the same time, if I go turn the knob to purposely hear Vince Neil singing that song because my flesh still gets stimulated and all those memories still make me happy, right. and I don't realize that I actually was a slave to that. And, and it still has a little, the little jig on the hook there. That's a problem. See what I'm saying? I'm giving myself to that. Yeah. I haven't gotten into the word yet, but I'm yielding <clears throat> myself to that. My members are yielding to sin. Sin is, sin is some deep stuff. But my little fingers went on the knob and turned it. And it was Brother Swagger preaching, but, but my flesh didn't want that. I'm just using that as an example. So I pressed on this other button, and there it is. Yeah, take a swig of whiskey and jump. Oh, yeah. See, now, now I've yielded my finger. My fingers yielded. My ears yielded. And then it stimulated my brain. And then the next thing you know, we got all kinds of stuff. You understand what I'm saying? I gave myself over to it. I served it. I obeyed its command. All right? That's the idea. Don't use your members or your body parts as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, because it's going to produce more sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. All right. So first of all, I wanted to talk to you about two words in there. I want to talk to you about yield and I want to talk to you about instruments. That word yield, it literally in the Greek means to stand before someone. So the idea is, is that like the other day, it's a long story, but I ended up in a courtroom for a ticket that I got and I did forgot to pay the fine. A long story, it's a crazy story. It was a cool story, but we don't have time for it. Well, I walked up to the thing, cause you know, I'm a preacher and I like to take control. I walked up to the podium, not cocky. I was ready to be humble, but I grabbed that mic and he said, sir, get your hand off of my microphone. <laughs> Whoa, baby. I knew that I was not, in control at that point. I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry you're wrong. Okay, that was his part. That was his microphone, and I was standing before him. 
And I was waiting for his command. See what I'm saying? That's actually what the word in the Greek means. To stand before someone ready for their command so that you can do what they're telling you to do. Wow. Yeah, that's good. So whenever you're yielding yourself to sin, mm. wow. you're in a place spiritually where you're standing before the power of sin. Right, right. In a sense, you can say the devil, but it's the, the idea is the power of sin. And you're waiting for his command. Mm, 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 and you're going to surrender. And like a servant, mm, you're going to do what it is that he told you to do. And you really, at, at some point in time, whenever the sinful nature is actually the king in your life, you really don't have a lot of power over it. Right. As a matter of fact, I know I got it in my notes somewhere, but let's just go ahead and say it now. Your willpower is not more powerful than sin. Let me say that again in the camera. Your willpower is not more powerful than sin. And why, the sinful nature. And so why are you even saying that, preacher? Because I remember the first time I heard somebody say that. I'm telling you right now, my flesh rose up on the inside of me. And listen to me. I should have known my willpower wasn't more powerful than sin, dude. I was drinking, sneaking beer in the backyard, looking at, uh, let me just be real, looking at internet pornography. I was a Christian. I loved God. But I had fallen back into sin. I should have known. I like to use myself transparently, right, to some extent, <laughs> to let you know I ain't arrived. Or I definitely hadn't arrived back then. And I still ain't arrived. Okay? But at the same time, you see, I was yielding my members. All right? And even in the midst of all of that, when I first heard that preacher say that, your willpower is not more powerful than the power of sin. I didn't like it. And that was a religious spirit. That wasn't even a sinful spirit. That was a religious spirit that did not understand the gospel and was trying to rise up in me. Come on. You, no, no, no. We don't even understand the spiritual battle. Here. That religious spirit was trying to <clears throat> rise up in me to make my members. And as a matter of fact, it did do it. I'm just talking to you for a second. Work with me. I did do it. I was listening. And I'm going to tell you right now, it was Jimmy Swagger. And you know what? You may not even like Jimmy Swagger because of the past, but it might be partly because you don't really understand what he's preaching today. Amen. Okay. But nevertheless, I had just, Christopher, my brother-in-law, wherever he is, my brother-in-law said, hey, that, how long was that? See, you probably don't remember. 16. No. Yeah. 16, 17 years ago, Brother Swagger's back on the radio. And I, at the time, the Lord had already done a word him off. And I was like, really? I was listening to any preacher I could. I was, dude, you don't even want to go do the research. I was listening to Mike Murdoch. Okay? I will tell you this, though. That was the first $1,000 offer I ever gave anybody. And I, and my heart was right when I gave that $1,000 offer. And it I'm giving thousands of that. And I'm happy to do it. I don't need you. I ain't asking you to pat me on the back. I won't give the Lord the money because guess what? Well, anyway, let's not get into word of faith. You can't out give God, though. I'll tell you that. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Matter of fact, I did it at TBI. <laughs> All right. I'm losing. Okay. <laughs> he said, your willpower is not more powerful than sin. He was saying all kinds of stuff. And that spirit of religion rose up in me and said, he, he don't love, he don't love Jesus or he ain't, right? What's he saying? And you know what? My member reached over there and turned that. A spirit of religion stimulated my members and caused me to do that. No, no, no. This is what the spirit of religion said. He's not sorry for what he did. It wasn't 30 seconds later, the Holy Spirit spoke. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. What you got to understand, understand is, is that I needed desperately to hear what that man said. Amen. Right, right. Oh, it's so beautiful to guide you, sir. Yeah. Because he allowed the devil. Listen to me. I don't get deep right now. And I'm talking about myself. But he allowed the devil to tell me something. And he used him as a pawn to make it more That's good. real to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, dude, how do you how do you even think right. that like God is so awesome? I'm gonna allow the devil to tell Matt with a spirit of religion to take his members and turn that radio down, then I'm going to tell him to turn the radio back on. And when he does, I'm going to have a pre-recorded radio thing 
play exactly when he turns the knob back on to give him the exact words that his spirit man has been needing to hear for the last 12 years of his Christianity and is going to set him free and give him revelation. <laughs> and so I turned it back on and he says, you were baptized into Christ when you were born. That's Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. When you were born again, you were baptized into Christ. He said, listen to me, Christian. There's no water in the Greek text. Meaning it's not water baptism he's talking about. That's right. Meaning when you got saved, the Holy <laughs> Spirit baptized you into Christ. He changed your position, and there you died with Christ. Now, water baptism perfectly represents outwardly what happened inwardly. But all of a sudden, and that might not even mean anything to you right now, but when he said that on that radio, there was a download from the Holy Ghost in the cabin of my car. And the Holy Spirit started saying, that's it, that's it, that's what you need to know, that's what you've been missing. Your old man born of Adam was baptized or translated or placed in Christ. And in God's mind, it took me many years to understand this. At the crazy level that I have to understand things. But God in one second. And one moment. Made something happen in my heart. That I didn't understand fully for another year. Yeah. And what he said was. The old man died in Christ. And a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. In other words. You came with your willpower. Change the way you're acting. And the harder you try. You're trying in your own strength. And you're frustrating the grace of God because you're trying to change yourself outwardly. And the only way that it can really, really, really happen is that you have to change inwardly. And the only way that can happen is that the Holy Spirit releases grace into your life. The power and the inner working of the Holy Spirit changing you on the inside, my friend. That's the definition of grace. A divine or godly influence upon the heart, the inner man, and its reflection in the life. Yes. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And that's the complete opposite of, oh, my willpower is going to give me time. See, my willpower is my flesh. Now, hold on. But what about the scripture in Galatians chapter 5 that says self-control? Yeah. Am I worn out? <laughs> Heal me from COVID, Lord. <laughs> Self-control is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in that context. <clears throat> what does that mean? It ain't your fruit, my friend. Amen. It means the Holy Spirit producing it in your life. So yeah, he wants to be able to give you control over yourself and your fleshly desires. Yeah. But it's not your willpower doing it. It's the power of the Holy Ghost moving through the finished work of Christ that he purchased for you when he died on the cross. When he shed his precious blood, he purchased freedom for you. He purchased the ability of the Holy Spirit to work in you. Oh, wait, hold on a second. The Holy Spirit has to have ability to work in me? Yeah. You know why? Because your free will will get in the way, my friend. Because yes, yes. you're over here in your own flesh and your own strength trying to make something happen and you are literally not giving permission in that moment. But I didn't even know a preacher. It don't matter whether you knew it or not. Present my word for the way that it's written and then I will use you. But I don't even know that. I didn't even know that people weren't presenting your way. But that you don't even need to know that right now. You just need to know what I told you. You don't have to know that your flesh was in the way. You just got to when you hear it, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. Yeah. And you need to be willing to humble ourselves. Yes. And we need to have a teachable spirit. And we need to realize that we don't know everything, my friend. Mm -hmm. The preacher, as hard as he study, he needs to be teachable. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you if I sat here and told each and every one of you, the way, each and every person in this place in some way probably has taught me something. I'm telling you right now. I don't go around telling you everything. But if I say, oh, no, that's good, it's a whole lot deeper than what you realize. Like something just happened in my brain. And I realized how, how many people walk around on this earth and they're like, man, you can't teach me nothing. And I was that way for a, little, for a while, too. I don't want to be that way no more. Amen. 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 So to yield means to stand before, ready to present yourself, ready to do service for instruments. Listen, this is the next part. Look, your members, you know what that is, right? Instruments, you know what that is in the Greek? Arms used in warfare weapons. Can you, now, now, you get the picture. No longer yield yourself to the power of sin where 
your members or your body parts are being used by sin as weapons of warfare. You get that? The, the, the power of sin, the enemy of our soul, literally uses human beings as weapons of warfare in, in the fight, in the spiritual fight of righteousness versus unrighteousness. Just like the fact that just like the fact that the, uh, that, the, that, that the Holy Spirit uses human beings as vessels through which he flows to minister truth of God to result in righteousness, the enemy of our soul. And sometimes the enemy of our soul will even use Christians. I mean, I'm, here's another example since we're on the cheeseburger thing. I'm at the, I'm at the thing. I'll order my cheeseburger. I ain't got no pickles. And I give her a what for. Whatever that is. You didn't put the pickles on my cheeseburger. <laughs> and then I drive off and she sees on the bumper sticker, Crossway Ministry, Patterson, Louisiana. And I ain't even really worried as much about the name as I'm trying to make a point. Man, I ain't going to that church. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you just use your members as a, as a weapon of warfare for the enemy. That's it. In some way. Now, did you... Were you like Anton LaVey, the Satanist that wrote the Satanic Bible, and you were willingly becoming a... No, of course not. But, whether you knew it or not, the enemy just used you for his work and, and, and it affected another human being. Yep. Because like Robert used to say in a simple version, can you go back and tell her about your Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because she don't want to talk about Jesus. Now, maybe one day she will, but anyway. So, yield... So, you know, I've heard that when you join the Marines, my dad was a Marine, they say to the men in boot camp, you're property of the Marine Corps now, son. Mm. You know, when a person enlists in a branch of the service, they're making a choice to willingly give themselves to that, right? Whether they realize what they're getting into or not, they did. They signed a piece of paper and they willingly submitted themselves to that. They may not like it once they realize what they've gotten into, but then it's too late. They're, they're to stand at attention, wait for the command, and then do what they're told. They're, they must yield themselves. You know, we are your mama, boy. That's what my dad, my, my daddy said. The drill sergeant said, you are property of the United States Marine Corps, son. I am your mama. I am your daddy. And you will stand there and you will stand in attention. And every order I work, you will receive my command and you will do it. Mm -hmm. Now, my crazy daddy, he's like, and the first one that don't like it, step up. My daddy's like, let's do it. <laughs> and he didn't tell me that story. Somebody else did. I'm like, really, dude? Anyway, that's, that's stubborn. <laughs> so point number one, you're in the army now, but who is giving the order? Because huh? the scripture said, don't yield yourself to sin, yield yourself to God. So you're in the army now, but who's giving the order? See, it's very similar to yielding to sin. When a person yields to sin, just like the military thing, they're y willingly giving themselves to sin service. It could be said that when a person repeatedly gives in to sin, they're being used as a weapon of warfare for the service of the enemy. Most people don't want to be in the devil's service, like I said. But nevertheless, by willingly giving ourselves to sin, we become kind of like his prophet. Or we're giving ourselves up. Even if we're Christians, he doesn't own us. The Lord owns us, but our behavior. And that's really what we're kind of talking about in Romans 6. Is more, 6 is more about our behavior. We're, we're, we're kind of looking still more like him. Let me give you a couple of examples. The husband that yields to drug use, yields to drug use, gets addicted. This is just an example. And eventually in some way causes financial ruin to his family and it alters the destiny of his children. He became a weapon of warfare for the enemy for unrighteousness. It doesn't, listen, God is sovereign and God can use all of that and God can heal. Amen. And he can use it and he can restore. I'm not saying that. I'm trying to make a point. The child that yields to drugs and becomes a drug addict causes untold heartache and sorrow for their parents. Whether they realize it or not, they became a weapon of warfare for the enemy for unrighteousness. But just because, just because maybe it caused lack of peace and, and the parent was looking at the situation and, you know, the, the person that commits adultery, they, they, yield, to, they yield to lust. It causes, it causes division and untold sorrow. And it maybe causes someone else to seek a way to numb the pain that they're feeling. Well, that person became a weapon of warfare for the enemy. 
at that moment. Again, God, God's such a good God. Amen. Just like he caused, just like he allowed me to turn the knob down and then turn the knob back up. Even though these things happen, God many times will use those tragic events as a catalyst to bring restoration, to bring healing. And only God can do that. Amen. So if I just hit, pressed your button, wherever you are, don't think that I'm over here. Because, uh, you know, some of these things are connected to my own life, right? Once you're saved, though, you're enlisted in a different service. Amen? Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. This is an important truth. Christians are people that are no longer dead. I want to make that point. See, the first time you were born physically, yeah, you were breathing and your little legs were kicking and you started crying and you, you know, and you had blood flowing through your veins, but you weren't alive to God. This is a very hard concept for people that don't under, that haven't even been born again yet. Because whenever you tell, people think we're all God's children. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible says. That's right. The Bible says those that believe he gave the power to be the sons of God. Yes, you're all God's creation. Yeah. He created us all. He created everything. But you're not, we're not his children until we become born again. That's right. That's the truth. But people don't, a lot of times people don't like the way that that sounds. You know? Christians are people that are no longer dead. Instead, they're alive. And again, when you're first born, you're not really alive. The spirit of that person is dead to God. But when that person is born again, the spirit of God floods into that lifeless soul and gives them the life of God. And now they're alive. Amen. Let's go to Romans 8, 2 for me real quick. Romans 8, 2 talks about that. And you know, the Lord already wanted me to mention to you earlier in the service about the spirit of God. And how it's the spirit of God that is the one that's giving us life. And he's doing it through what Jesus has done for us at the cross. We need to understand the working together, the unity together of the Lamb and the Spirit. We need to understand that there's unity between the Spirit of God and Jesus. That it's one God with two different functions in the human life. And listen, Jesus said he, he was talking about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will take of what is mine. In other words, all my teachings and everything that I've done, and he will show it unto you. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not to say, hey, everybody, look at me. Hey, everybody, look at me. No, the Holy Spirit's ministry, what the Holy Spirit wants to do is what the Father wants done. What does the Father want done? He wants Jesus magnified. He wants Jesus glorified. It pleased the Father to give all the glory to the Son. Does that make sense? So the Holy Spirit's always going to point you to Jesus. In this passage of scripture, it tells us that there are two spiritual laws in existence. One is the law at the bottom of sin and death. See, the first time you're born, even though you're a baby, you're born into under the law of sin and death. We're not talking about the law of Moses. We're not talking about a speeding violation. We're not talking about not wearing your seatbelt. We're talking about spiritual laws. A law of sin and death. You're born into that. The result of sin is death. But there's another law that's more powerful than the law of sin and death. And it is the law of the Spirit. Look at that word right there. It's capitalized. It's about the Holy Spirit. There's a law of the Spirit of life. See, the law of the Spirit of the Holy Spirit brings life. It brings life in Christ. I, listen, I'm, I wasn't even going to do it, but and I'm going to I'm not going to take the time on this. That's why I used to always write this. And that's the first time I wrote on the board. So whoever claims it, I'm so sorry. First time I wrote on the board in so long. In Christ, it's a prepositional phrase. It's throughout the New Testament, and it means something. You know what it means? Come on, let's let's break this down. Let's dissect it a little bit. Just work with me. Work with my brain for a second. And I know many of you already know, but I'm going to keep reminding you. <coughs> Because some of y'all get tired and y'all fall and y'all tired and I get it because I'm tired. And we'll fall asleep. But maybe you know it. Don't get bored. Just repeat it to somebody. You were born the first time in Adam. You were born in sin. But then you got born again. I'm about to go over that way. You got born again. 
And when you got born again, the Holy Spirit baptized you into Christ. Yeah. And he put you over here. And I'm not going to do the whole thing I used to do, but I used to lay down on the floor signifying that you're dead. Adam, your first birth in Adam, the old man, he died. Yeah. He died with Jesus. Amen. He was buried with Jesus. Amen. And now he's dead. Rest in peace, Adam. <laughs> Rest in peace, Adam, because you're dead, according to the mind of God. He's just trying to convince you and I. You're dead, Adam. And now you resurrect in Christ. Yeah. Your new position. In Christ, hallelujah. On the day it first happened, you were already sanctified. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You were already whole. Right. You were already separated. If you were really sa saved. Yeah. Well, what are you talking about? Because you're in Christ. <laughs> you're in Christ. And now in Christ. <laughs> I know. Y'all seen this so many times. Now in Christ. Look, he's the king. It was a crown of thorns over there. I'm not going to take the time to write it. But, now, but listen, he's a resurrected king. Yeah. Ain't nobody putting no more thorns on his head. You hear me? He ain't coming back on the donkey. He's coming back on the white horse. Yes, sir. He's gonna, he ain't going to be born in a stable, a manger. He's going to be on the throne. The throne of David. He's yeah, going to yeah. rule and reign upon this earth. Yeah. It's no longer going to be the spirit of disobedience that rules the atmosphere. It's going to be the spirit of the Christ. Hallelujah. The anointed one. Hallelujah. The one that purchased Power and, and, and it purchased the ability for you and I to live for him. He's going to sit on the throne. And right now you're in him. You're in Christ. That is your position, my friend. When the father looks at you, you listen to me. Just believe what I'm trying to tell you. When the father looks at you, you know why this is so important? Because you and I are walking around here because of all of our failure. Come on, somebody. Get, can, can I get a what what that we still ain't got it all right? Y'all know. In the last few days, with all this stress, y'all probably done acted the wrong way. <laughs> Come on, somebody help me out. Because I know I ain't perfect. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's not your righteousness that God is working on. Working through. Yes, he's working <laughs> on your righteousness, trying to make it look more like his righteousness. What God is working through is the righteousness of Jesus that now he sees when he looks at you because you're in Christ. You've been clothed in Christ Jesus. You put him on, that's Galatians chapter 3. You've been clothed with him. You have put him on as though he were a garment. How did you do that? You didn't walk into a closet and take it off a hanger. You believed by faith. On that day that you believed by faith, all that happened. You didn't know it. That's why the Lord said, no, you won't present my word for the way that it's written. And then I will use you because people need to know it. Amen. People need to know we're walking around under a cloud of guilt and condemnation whenever we aren't doing it for the Lord. And I'm not trying to give anybody a license for sin, but I'm trying to make a point here that we should not be walking around under condemnation and guilt because Jesus paid a high price so that you and I could understand that we're innocent in Christ. In the eyes of God. When we begin to believe that part. Not, not just to believe in Jesus for the day that we got saved. But to continue to believe in Jesus and his finished work to make us look more like Jesus. Now let me, let me take a point there. I've been in the church for a little while now. I got saved when I was 19. I'm 54. When I first got saved, the way the message was preached was, you're saved now. You're, you're a different person now you got to start acting right, and this is how you do it. You read more Bible, you go to church more, you pray more, you need to get baptized in the Holy Ghost, and you need to speak in other tongues. You should be doing all of those things, because if you don't do that, then guess what? You're not really being able to learn of Jesus the way that you're supposed to. But listen to me, you got to be careful that you're not turning your, the way that you learn about God into the object of your faith. See, do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I'm failing God. I'm struggling in this area. So now what I got to do to fix that is I, needed to, I need to read my Bible more. I need to read three chapters. Yes, you need to read your Bible more because we all need to read our Bible more, including me. Why? Because it's life and it's, and it's God's word and it shows us his mind and it shows us his heart. And the more I put that in me instead of Vince Neal's stupid song, I'm, I'm thinking more like Jesus and less like him. Make sense? But I cannot change the object of my faith from what Jesus has already done at the cross 
Before the foundation of the earth, you were redeemed, bought back, not with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but by the precious blood of a lamb. Before God said, let there be light, before God reached down and molded Adam out of the unfallen clay of the earth and breathed his life-giving spirit into it, he already knew man was going to fall. He already knew he was going to send Jesus. He already knew Jesus was going to die on the cross. And he already knew he was going to buy us back through the precious blood of life. <laughs> he already knew all. He ain't changing his plan. I know y'all heard me say that before. All these preachers out here preaching all these other little things. God ain't, God is not about, listen to me preacher, I know you're not watching me, but listen to me preacher, he's not going to do it the way you want him to do it. He's not going to do it the way your father, your teacher before you, and his teacher before him, and his teacher before him told you to present the word the way that they wanted to present it because it made people happy and they sit in the chairs and they give their money into the coffers of the church. That's not how God works. God's got a plan and he's sticking to it and it's in his book. Does that make sense? It's a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And when you begin to understand that and begin to believe that and begin to daily walk in that, guess what? It's going to, where, where, where's it at? It's going to make you free from the law of sin and death. When Adam submitted to Eve, when Eve submitted to the serpent and then Adam submitted to Eve, guess what happened? A law came into existence. The law of sin and death. But God had a plan. And that plan was going to be Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, it provided the opportunity for people to put their faith in that. And then it allows that law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, to now become real in each and every one of our hearts as we begin to believe. And it gives us freedom over the law of sin and death. It gives us freedom <clears throat> over the power of sin. It allows you and I to not have to yield our members to the work of the unrighteousness in them. It allows you and I to now we can yield our members. Don't you want, I know you do because you love the Lord. I, mean, I know most of you in here pretty good. And you love Jesus. And you want to be youthful. Even if it's, listen, even, we may not even understand what that means at, at this point completely. I, mean, I may not understand what it means. But I know that it looks more like Jesus than it does like Matt. <laughs> and what I mean is, what did Jesus do? He served. I'm not trying to say, oh, I need you to go work in the nursery. Yeah, I do need people to, or I need people to, yeah, that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about serving Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't say, build your church, man. No, build the church of the Lord, the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Amen? To serve the Lord when nobody else is looking. To serve the Lord when your name's not on a list. What do you mean? To act like Jesus and whenever somebody's in need, whatever that little thing is that God allows you to do. I'm not telling you what that is. To minister. Sometimes it is. It's giving them a little bit of money. Sometimes it's just giving them a little, little word. Man, hey, look, man, the Lord's going to get you through this, right? Sometimes it's actually going another step and laying your hands on them and praying for them. Sometimes it's I don't know what it is, but you, and you can't even work it. I can't. Even, I, don't, I hate to get so deep into all this, but I've tried to do it with the wrong motives before, and then it don't work. He's got to do a work in us before he can do a work through us. And when you got the, when we start to have a heart that looks more like Jesus, it's more selfless. It's more about servitude. It's more about servanthood. It, we begin to understand that he was selfless, not selfish. And we begin to realize when we look in the spiritual mirror that I'm not really like lining up and that I'm still pretty self. And it's okay because we're all like that, guys. In our own way, come on, in our own way, we still like that. And we need the Lord to do a work in us. Amen. And the less, like us, like John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase. I, I don't even want to stop talking. I know I got to at some point. But listen, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that you got your own thing going on? Just imagine you're John the Baptist. And the Lord, the Lord called you out. I mean, here you come. Hey, I mean, listen, I don't know. I just feel like he was probably like an old ancient Marine, you know. He shows up in camel, 
He's wearing camel's hair. He's got a beard with locusts hanging out in it. He's got honey down his beard. And listen, the religious folks are over there trying to do their thing, and they're not presenting the word of God for the way that it's written, and they're holding the people in bondage. They're allowing the people to flounder in false doctrine. Just essentially, that's what's happening. And here comes John the Baptist in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And all of a sudden, the multitudes flock him. And he's baptizing them. Prepare the way of the Lord. Repent of your sin to get your heart ready because he's coming. Can I tell you, church, he's coming again? Prepare you the way of the Lord. Allow your heart to be cleansed to understand. And all of these people are thronging him. And all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria were baptized of John. And then one day he's at the banks of the Jordan River and there he comes. The one that they had been waiting for, the one that mankind is waiting for, whether they know it or not. And he right, says, right. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. And then, guess what? One day, some of his disciples come to him, Hey, Master John, like we hear Jesus is baptizing more people than you are. You know what John said? I must decrease <laughs> so that he might increase. Yeah. How would you like it if you had a church with 250 people in it and somebody started a new church next to you and everybody left your church and went to that church? Do you think you wouldn't have a problem? Come on, somebody. <clears throat> Listen to me. We can't even, if we, I'm, I've never been a musician. I wish I was. We can't even guard our heart if we, I'm just using, I ain't talking about no guitar players. <laughs> yeah, we can't even guard our heart if we play guitar and a new guitar player shows up. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on, somebody help me. We can't even guard our heart and we over here singing and a new vocalist shows up in their voice. And we're, oh man, your voice is so good. And we over here somebody telling them that. And we're like, but what about my voice? <laughs> you know, we can't even help handle it like somebody said, Robin, you know, Robin said, man, you ought to hear Paris Reagan. I'm like, yeah, I know Paris Reagan. We can't, we can't even handle that. Come on, somebody. Paris Reagan is doing a great work for the Lord and he articulates the word of God better than I do because he uses less words than I do. And, and I don't make you forget the point I was trying to make. Okay? I know that. <laughs> Lord, help me. But my point is the Lord wants things like that to happen in our life to show us what's in us because he yeah. wants to change us. I must decrease so that he might increase because it ain't the match show, my friend. It's not the whoever show. It's the Jesus show. He's to be magnified. He's to be glorified. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants Jesus magnified. Yes. 